My childhood best friend, Mary and I, were around 11 or 12 years old at the time. Mary's family had their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our hometown and would spend the entire summer each year living in their camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week and we were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night that I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out but beginning to lose light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road with maybe 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest with more tall thick brush. As we were walking along, not seeing a single other person on the path in front or behind us, we hear a sudden rustling and snapping of branches. Similar to the sound of maybe a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Mary glances back and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice and chose to listen. We both start to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off. We pick up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint, knowing the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away at this point. The path soon breaks and we are in the parking lot. Suddenly, Mary steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake and the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop, and I go along with it silently, understanding ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Mary is clearly panicking at this point. We are both looking around, but it seems whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Mary walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak, and we climb in and begin to paddle out into the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that there was a man behind us and that the man had stopped running at us, very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He had been wearing a long black coat with a hood up, despite it being the middle of July, had a terrible smirk on his face, and she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away into his coat. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes after we walked past. Given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path, we reached the centre of the lake and stopped paddling. I pull out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had, thank God, given me, just in case. I hand it to Mary and tell her to call her parents to come pick us up. As the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore and go pale, lifting a hand to point to what she's seeing. I turn and there was the man, stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps, never looking away from us, before finally disappearing. It took a few tries to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out so bad the entire time. As the sun got lower and lower, we did manage to have someone come with the truck, but by the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark outside. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I don't know why we didn't just go up to the ice cream shop, inform an adult there and ask her parents to come get us then. But it worked out, we got back safe, and we thankfully never saw the man again. So about 12 years ago, I was 9 years old, and I was home alone with my 12 year old brother. We were supposed to go to my aunt's house to have lunch and wait for my mother there. We always did that because we were too young to stay home alone, according to my mum. We got up at 10.30am, I took a shower, then my brother did the same. After that, we were both in the bathroom brushing our teeth and finishing up, when we heard someone knocking on our door. Since every time someone knocked at our door, they turned out to be salesmen or Jehovah's Witnesses. 
we just waited for them to go away. After a couple of minutes, I went to see if they were still outside through the window and no one was there. What a relief. We continued getting ready and we saw a shadow go by through the bathroom window, which was a small square made with frosted glass. It makes everything behind it really blurry. We waited and saw in case it was just a bird flying by when a hand hit it clear as day. We got scared. We didn't know what to do. My brother had his cell phone, so he immediately called the police. Whilst it was ringing, we heard a loud bang at the door. Someone was brute forcing it. I don't know if they were kicking it or ramming it, but it was one of the most frightening things I've ever heard. My brother told me to lock the bathroom door, so I did. It took five bangs until the perpetrator could finally bash open the door. Then the police answered. I remember the exact thing my brother said. He was whispering. His voice could barely be heard. Hello, there is someone in our house. I think they are stealing. Then a pause. We are at. Our address. Another pause. I went my little brother. Locked in our bathroom, please hurry. Whilst this was happening, I was sitting against the wall, hugging my knees. It was one of the most nerve wracking experiences ever. I could hear the man going through all of our stuff, emptying stands, going up and down the stairs, opening cabinets. He even broke a few cups and plates. I don't know why. Then I heard the sound my cell phone makes when it turns off, and I remembered leaving it on the kitchen table. I felt so stupid for leaving it there. Things continued for a couple of minutes, and we heard him trying to open the door to the bathroom. My brother got a hold of a big metal rod we had lying around. He started kicking the door. Who is there? The man screamed. We said nothing. Another kick, then another. I felt I was about to have an anxiety attack. My chest started to ache. I had chills and was really hot. I tried to remain calm, but it was just too much. After that, he finally stopped. We heard the door opening and in silence. We waited for almost 10 minutes before leaving the bathroom. The living room was a total mess, lots of paper and books on the floor. The cabinets were open, cups and plates on the floor. In our mother's bedroom, the nightstand and the closet were open and everything inside them was all over the place. Upstairs in our room, it was the same thing. In about five minutes, the man was able to go through everything we had and left a total mess. After that, my brother called my mum and she ordered us to go to my aunt's house, ASAP. So we did. When we got there, I was a little more relaxed. My aunt was waiting for us with ice cream. Probably because my mum told her everything and she wanted to calm us down. We went back home at about five o'clock. My mum told her boss she had a home emergency, so she left early. She tidied up the house, cleaned up, and left everything the way it was before, so we could be relaxed. I really appreciate her effort and my aunts to calm us down and do everything so we didn't have to think about it. According to my mum, the police got home after she arrived at three o'clock, four hours after the incident. She explained everything, but because of the lack of evidence, nothing could be done. The man was never caught, and honestly, I don't think they even tried to search for him. The next few days, my mum was home with us. Luckily no one was hurt, and he only took use of stuff. But at the time, I was really scared. To a nine-year-old, an experience like this can have serious repercussions. I'm lucky it never came to that, and I got over it after a couple of weeks. Before I continue with the final story, if you've enjoyed this video so far, please leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to see future content from me, as well as help me in the algorithm. Thank you. Like most people these days, I had a fucked up childhood. Who doesn't, right? My father took off before I was born, and my mother was left to care for me on her own. 
a skill she was sorely lacking. My mother slipped right back into the drug-addled, party lifestyle she'd enjoyed before I was born, and had soon turned our two-bedroom apartment into an opium den. For the first five years of my life, I walked around in a confused, terrifying mist. The smoky air would flood down the hallway from our living room, and slip under my bedroom door. It always seemed to linger for days. I know now that my mother wasn't a bad person, just a victim of her addictions. When she did have spare money, she would put food in the house or buy me clothes from Goodwill. The only pieces of furniture I had in my bedroom was a mattress set and a little blue and white toy chest. Not that I had a lot of toys to put in it, of course. Just the three I had gotten for birthdays. One was an art kit, one was a red wagon, and the last, my pride and joy, was a doll named Betsy. Betsy was my best friend. We would have imaginary tea parties together, sleep together, and even take baths together. Sometimes, I even remember her voice. When I fought back on my conversations with the doll in adulthood, I realised that I was likely suffering from delusions, thanks to the always present butts of smoke that laid claim to the dingy hallways and draughty bedrooms of our small apartment. Still, I remember the sound of her voice, a pleasant, tingling lilt that was almost always coupled with a raucous giggle. I also remember the things that she said to me and the things she wanted me to do. She asked me to steal, usually food or pens and pencils. She wanted me to bring her forks and knives and hit the bad man who slept on our couch. It was always something and I would always get into trouble, but she wouldn't. When I told my mother who had put me up to these games, she would scoff and shake her head. She never believed me. Adults never did. Around my sixth birthday, I asked my mother for a birthday party. I wanted to invite the mean girls from school and serve them cake and ice cream to make them like me. I remember standing in the kitchen that day with such hopes, having just asked the most important question of my life. The glass bottle of Coca-Cola I held was shaking in my nervous hands. I waited with bated breath as my mother continued putting groceries away, almost as if she hadn't heard me, but I knew she had. Finally, just as I had failed a second time to muster the courage to repeat my question, she turned around and gave me a flippant shake of her head. A birthday party? Laura, that's ridiculous. I can't afford to feed 15 children that aren't even mine. Hell, I can barely afford to feed you. You eat like an elephant. Especially for a girl your size. Or I'm sorry, Betsy does. There's barely anything left for me to eat around here, much less a classroom of other people's brats. My face fell as she shook her head, mumbled something else under her breath and stumbled off into the living room. I heard the music go up then as more people walked in the door. Some left, some stayed. I never knew them either way. It simply wasn't fair. My mother threw parties all the time. What about me? I was a kid. All my friends had birthday parties, and now the mean girls at school would know I was too poor to have one, and they would tease me even more. I felt tears start to well in the corners of my eyes, and I choked back a sob while I ran to my room and slammed the door behind me. Betsy was lying on the bed and smiling. She was always smiling. Usually it made me feel better, but today it just made me angry. She just kept staring at me, smiling. She was going to tell me to do something bad, again. This was why my mother wouldn't throw me a birthday party. It was because of all the trouble I got into because of her. This was her fault. Betsy didn't have to go to school and Betsy never got into trouble like I did. And in my young mind, I truly believed it was the doll, not my mother, who was to blame for everything. I snapped then. I screamed in indignant rage, and I threw the bottle as hard as I could at the bed. It hit Betsy on her forehead, and she fell on the floor. Good. I picked up the bottle, and I hit her again, and again. I thought I heard her laugh, and I hit her harder. Then I laughed. When my rage was spent, I dragged Betsy to my toy chest, and threw her in. I slammed it shut, and kicked the chest against the wall. I never wanted to see Betsy again, ever. I never owned another doll after Betsy. 
About a week later, the police came and two nice ladies took me to live in a new home in a new state, with food and toys and no drugs. The trunk went into storage and the wagon disappeared. I never saw my mother again. As I got older, my foster parents admitted she was in jail doing 25 years. That was fine with me. I felt nothing for her anyway. I still had nightmares because of my life with that woman. But then slowly, I began to heal. I focused on doing well in school and I ignored my mother's letters from prison. She reached out to me several times in my 20s as well, but I always declined her calls. That is, until this morning. I'm 30 now with my own children and a loving, honest husband. I have a beautiful house, two dogs, and a career as a social worker trying to make a difference for kids who had it bad like me. I'm happy, I'm steady, and I'm content. So when I got a voicemail from my mother informing me she had been paroled and that she wished to speak, I decided to let her say her piece. Since the kids were home from school, I went out into our shed in the backyard to return my mother's call. The shed was the children's domain and they used it to play in the summer. I sat on my old toy chest, which was currently being used as a tea party table, and dialed the number she had left me. Three rings. Hello, Laura? Hello, mother. How are you? Oh, Laura, thank you for speaking to me. I know you have your own life now and a family. I would love to meet them someday. I just wanted to tell you how sorry I am for everything. Mother, you are not meeting my kids, ever. And since you called me, I'm going to say what I've needed to for years. The opium, the heroin, they destroyed you. And the worst of it is that you almost took me down with you. I was five. There was no home for a child. Honestly, I'm surprised it took you so long to get caught. Laura, I know how it seems, but I honestly know nothing. Look, it hardly matters, and I do understand why you would feel that way. Why you would hate me and not want me to meet your little ones. I learned a lot about forgiveness while I was away, and just... Oh, Laura, I'm so sorry about Betsy. Betsy? I paused, confused. Why would you care about her? I know, Laura. Believe me, I do. It was all my fault. The drugs, the partying, and Betsy. Oh, God, if I had only paid attention. If I had only known. She's gone, and it's because of me. As my mother began to cry, I tapped my fingers on the toy box impatiently. The drugs had clearly fried her brain. Mother, I sighed. Why are you talking about Betsy? And why do you even care? I know where Betsy is. Right underneath me. What are you talking about, Laura? Oh God, where is she? I shifted uncomfortably. Well, Betsy's in the trunk, where she's always been. There was a beat of stunning silence. What do you mean your sister's in the trunk? Sister? What the hell are you talking about? Back on drugs so soon? That's a record even for you. Betsy is a goddamn doll. I locked her in my toy box a few days before you got arrested for possession. Laura? Oh God, no. No, Laura, what have you done? I wasn't arrested because of the drugs, Laura. I was arrested because of Betsy's disappearance. You always called her your little doll, but we thought you knew. Oh God, we thought you knew, Laura. What have you done to my baby? My mind had gone blank, and with no emotion, I set the phone down next to me and stood up. I could hear the muffled sound of my mother's anguished cries and feel the dark clutch of possibility in my own chest. Memories were stirring in the back of my mind, threatening to flood forward into my consciousness. They pushed against the door in my mind that had been locked so tightly for so long that I had forgotten it was even there. Was it even possible? Could the trauma and the opium have really led me to believe that a small child was actually a doll, begging for food and utensils to eat with, asking me to protect her from the bad man? No. I slowly turned around and brought my eyes down to the makeshift tea party table. Surely it was too small. You couldn't fit a person in there. You couldn't. But then, what about a very small, starving, emaciated child? What about her? Would she fit? Would an investigator even bother looking for a person in this chest? I knew I wouldn't. It was just too small. And I was sure we had opened the toy box at some point over the years, hadn't we? Or had something swimming in the dark recesses of my memories always stopped me? I couldn't remember ever seeing it open. I knelt down to the ground 
and opened the clasps. It would be better not to look. After all that I had overcome, this new life that I had earned for myself, it could all be undone by opening this toy box. I shouldn't open it. I should throw it into a landfill and forget it ever existed. I should not look inside. I opened the chest. I never had a doll. My mother never could afford to buy me one. I never had a wagon either, for that matter. But I did have a toy box. A pretty blue and white toy box. And when I was five, I beat my little sister to death and put her in it. <laughs>